Paul again, YouTube. I'm Sir Slobs, and I do Yu-Gi-Oh deck profiles here. So we're diving to Atlantis, where Yu-Gi-Oh was born to fish up another profile. Today, as you can see, it's Mermel on the playmat. Since their debut in Abyss Rising in late 2012, Mermel have always been dragging opponents to their watery graves, and have almost always been at least playable for those eight years. Mermel are one of my favourite decks of all time. The constant tinkering and innovating combined with the complex combos always has me taking a swim in the Mermel card pool to make the deck even better. So let's dive right in and see what these guys can do. Okay, so let's submerge ourselves in the monsters, which I've got to be honest is the vast majority of this build. Most of the Mermel builds that I've ever seen really have been kind of monster mashes. So we're running three Abysteus in declining rarity order. So Abysteus, I would say, is the, is the best Mermel card. His low activation cost and his search effect is a, one of the best starters the deck always has, and you've, I'm sure you've seen countless YouTube videos of Teus plus Dragoons equals win, basically. From there, we've got to Megalo. So Megalo, I've bounced around between two and three over the course of time. I think I'm currently sitting on two. He can just look, be a little bit too unwieldy in hand, uh, if you've got more than two in hand. But he's still crucial to most of the combos and he's very searchable, so he's not too bad. Another card that I bounce around with a bit is Gund, which I'm currently running two of. So Gund, if it's discarded, you get special summon one, which obviously works really well in combination with Megalo, because you know if you've got additional Mermels in hand, then Gund, Gund provides you with that extension. It is only once per turn though, so you've got to really be careful with that. Pike, I'm running one of, so if he's normal or special summoned, you can set, discard one water once the graveyard to add level three water. Unfortunately, he misses timing because he's a when, not an if, which is a little bit sad in quite a lot of scenarios. He's still very much worth the, worthy of the one space, I think, and the fact he's level four combines well with some of the water extra deck monsters, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. So that rounds up the Mermel portion of the deck. In the classic case, I'm running a Merlantian build, as it's been commonly known. So I'm running three prints. Three prints is an absolute monster. So he, he's busted, he's basically a plus two because you dump a Dragoon, search your Dragoons, and the Dragoons that you dump search the card, so he's just great. He's also hand trap resilient because he sends for cost, like Kaleido Chick or some of the other cards, and this guy I suppose is the original Kaleido Chick sending for cost to, as, a, as a foolish is so flipping good. His secondary effect's actually not that bad either, so when he's sent to the graveyard to activate a water monster effect, he can special summon an Atlantean monster from the graveyard, so again, even that is, is useful. And again, what kind of makes the deck tick that much is the fact that we've got three Dragoons. We suffered a long time under the ban list, having this limited and then semied. But not once per turn, search when it's sent to the graveyard to activate a War Monsters effect. Also, all face up level three or lower Sea Serpent monsters can attack your opponent directly. How broke is that? I bet you use that all the time. In all honesty, that doesn't come up at all. Uh, so, from there we're running two Heavy Infantry, which is our last Atlantean uh, card. Again, you could run uh, the discard to pop the face down, which I'm now f forgetting what it's called, but Infantry is discard to pop the face up, which is just much more common to use. He's also got a, an additional normal summon, so he can get the ball rolling and be an extender if you need to, but most of the time I find I, myself adding him late in the combo to act as a disruption. From there, just recently to three, is Deep Sea Diva. And Diva used to be absolutely OP, busted in the deck. I think it's an absolute hand trap magnet, and sometimes I find myself going to Prince over Diva if I've got both in hand, just because I really, really need the, the you know, the, the Prince to go off. Whereas Diva, it kind of just sits on the field. But at least it's a tuner, so it can be used for Chris Drom, Halka Feedbrax plays, if you've got an extender. Speaking of extenders, where I'm still running the Swap Frog engine, so I'm running three Swap Frogs recently. Upgraded myself to Hollows with these guys, because they, they're still expensive. Well, these guys aren't expensive, but the other ones were. So Swap Frog is great. One discard to summon it, dumps. So even if you do that, you, you know, the fact you're using that with 
your Ronin Toadin gives you additional Link Fog because Ronin Toadin can be summoned back when, by banishing the Swap Fog. It's just it's just all around a great extender. From there, I'm running two Aqua Spirits. So Aqua Spirits obviously great for going into your rank four plays, which are pretty crucial in this deck. It also is pretty good graveyard control because it banishes a water monster special summon itself, which is good for Moulin Glacier, the Elemental Lord. So Moulin Glacier is just a silly card really, and I could see it getting hit. Um, ripping two cards out of your opponent's hand, you know, before they even have a chance to go is, is obscenely good. You have got to be real careful about leaving him on board though because you lose your next battle phase after you've after he, after he gets removed from the from the field. And it can also be a bit of a brick, especially a late game. From there, we're running a couple more one offs. So, we're running the one Lapis dra Dragon, which, if it's added to hand, it can special summon itself, which is great for the Halka Food Brax play. And again, Fishbog Launcher is my normally my go to monster that I get from the Halka Food Brax. Basically, a level one tune that can be special summoned from the graveyard. All round good. So, swimming right along into the spells. I'm running three of the new Deep Sea Aria. So this is kind of like a rotor. So you banish a water monster, add a level four, or a sea serpent monster. It's only once per turn, which again is a bit rough. And the banish a water monster is it can be tough. So it's not it's, it's definitely trickier to use than your standard rotor. Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm running some more of the discard outlets like Swap Frog and stuff like that, because your Swap Frog enables you to use this card. From there, we're running standard Lake or three, call by the grave. So, again, I think my explanation in the Orcus video is I deem this card to be entirely necessary to most modern deck builds. Prevention of hand traps, and it's also an offensive card. It's just, it's just great. From there, I'm running two Pot of Avarice. So, most of our combos swim through an absolute load of cards, be that extra deck cards or main deck cards. So, he's almost always live. It can be a little bit of a brick if you draw multiples, especially in the opening hand, but I think that's worthy of the, the trade-off. Obviously you are, you know, prone to the randomness of a card game, but the fact that this gives you recycle and also recovery is great. From there we're running our three kind of generics, so Monster Reborn for your recovery slash extension, one one for one, which again I think some people have tended to take out, but I think it's still worthy of the addition. Again, it can get a water monster in grave at absolute worst case scenario for Deep Sea Aria. And it's your extra copy of Prince. And then the one upstart goblin, 39 card deck. Another catchphrase. So from there, the final spell is a scale of the Mizuchi. So this is equivalent to a mirror mail, gains 800. And then when a spell effect is activated, you negate that, which stops the resolution of the spell, not the activation, yada yada yada. It doesn't come up that often. But it's a spell negator, you've just got to be careful because your opponent can easily bait it out. Okay, so plunging ourselves into the extra deck. I'm running three Synchros. I'm running Ravenous Crocodragon. I'm running Risen Dragite. And I'm running Desert Locusts. So, Crocodragon, when it's you know, Synchro Summon, he gets draw cards equal to the non-tuners, which is good. Normally it's only one, because you'll be going to this using probably Deep Sea Diva and one of your level sevens. You can discard two cards to pop a card, and it's a water monster, so it slots right in because all the Atlanteans activate off that. So if you discard Heavy Infantry, you can get two pops off this bad boy. And he's just generally a real good fit. Risen Dragite is normally used with Fishbowl Launcher and one of our level seven tuners. You could run Savage Dragon, but I prefer Dragite because some of our plays lock us into water monsters. And obviously this is a water monster and Savage Dragon is a dark. Uh, so, he, you know, he, you're not using his bounce effect, but you will be using his spell and trap negation effect. Desert Locust is another rip for Crystron Halka Fibrax. Spoiler alert, we are playing that. But, you know, in combination, Moulin Glacier and Desert Locust rips three cards out of your opponent's hand before they've even had a go. Mine's a bit of a mixed build, it's not entirely focused on the rip, it's not entirely focused on the ball break, it's kind of focused on a bit of the middle. So from there running Totally Awesome and his trusty companion Bahamut Shark. So obviously Totally Awesome is, you know, an Omni the Gate and we can hard make it or we can make it with Bahamut Shark, both of which are great. From there running one more rank four, which is Abyss Dweller, obviously the Negate or graveyard effects is 
amazing, but we also gain 500, which can be relevant here. Both Bahamut Shark and the Abyss Dweller also activate Dragoons if, if Dragoons is detached, which is awesome. From there, we've got a couple of rank 7s. I've got number 11, Big Eye, and Mirabel Abyss so, big guy, I think he's worthy of the addition. He's, you know, he's a targeting removal, but he's non-destruction removal. So he could be a real good problem solver. Gauss is a great one to go for if your hand's a bit clunky. Sometimes those level sevens don't quite match up well with the rest of your hand. And a monster negation is obviously great. Although he does limit attacking monsters above level five, which is a super random effect. But yeah, you've got to be a bit wary of that. From there, the rest of the extra deck is link monsters. So I'm running one this Lacia, so discard your opponent's turn to add an ML monster, and the discard is obviously going to trigger some of your Elantian cards, so this combined with infantry equals a disruption, and if it's sent to the graveyard you can dump a card and also special summon a card, so it's just it's just really good. Also gives 500 attacks with monster points here, which isn't super relevant. From there running Crystron Halper Firebrax, so obviously this guy's just busted. He's easy to get out with Diva or with your Lapis Dragon, normally summoning your uh, Fishball Launcher. So they're running Coral and Anemone and Starboy. So Starboy kind of goes in conjunction with an enemy because an enemy isn't, uh, isn't uh, the standard water monster thing. So it's not an Aqua, it's not a Sea Serpent, it's not a fish. So an enemy, what it does is it can special summon a water monster with less than 1500 attack in the graveyard so it's great recovery play because you can get back your prints and other things as well. From there running one Bujinki Ashima. So this is a recent addition to the deck. So Ashima can special summon the same level monster from your hand down your graveyard and then you have to overlay into something from there so it's a great way of making your Bahamut Shark or well mostly Bahamut Shark. <laughs> then from there we're running one more, Link 2, which is Nightmare Phoenix, and a Link 4, which is the Appaloosa, which again, you can see, I've got another OCG variant over the TCG Companion, mostly because it's like a fraction of the cost. So Nightmare Phoenix could be whatever you want it to be, but I think it goes quite well with the Appaloosa, because if you've got spare resources, Appaloosa and then Nightmare Phoenix means that the Appaloosa can't, doesn't just die from a, from a rogue 2000 attack body. And obviously Appaloosa, you could trade out for something else, but it's basically one of the best rank fours in the game right now. So, in conclusion, Mermels have been good since they swam out of Konami's R&D department. The lack of reliance on the normal summon means you can tech in a variety of different engines and I think will make them at least playable for a very long time. The ceiling of the deck has never really been higher I was going to go for a 4 for meta relevance, but I like these guys super much and they're great, so I'm going with a 5. I also love the way that the deck plays, you know, the rambling long combos, trying to toolbox out what you want and for the situation. It's always a blast, although I would watch the clock in a competitive tournament. So it's, a, it's another perfect 5 out of 5. Cost-wise, we take a slight dive, though. The deck has always been a bit pricey, and now is no different. With my estimates coming in at about $490 from TCG Player. So you need to find some buried treasure in order to buy these fishy brethren. So what do you think of the uh, Mermel deck? Let me know, and be sure to check out the channel for other videos.